And we're live. Yeah. Welcome back to another outstanding episode of the Square Table Degenerates Podcast. Special time. I know it's like 2.30 or something like that. We normally go live at 9.30. We'll be going live again tonight, but today we have, we're joined today by Mr. Dennis Seaton from the band Musical Youth. How are you today, sir? I'm very well, thank you. And you? I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm uh, just sitting over here passing the dutchie to myself a couple dozen times, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> what dutchie are you passing? I'm passing the uh, illegal dutchie. Well, it's legal. It's legal in a while if you got a car. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's I'm not, not a dutchie. I'm, it's not, this, isn't a, this isn't a dutchie from the song. No, not even no, close. that's not a dutchie. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's establish that. So, you are from Birmingham in the UK, is that correct? That's right, Birmingham, England. Now, I looked up Birmingham. A lot of people from the United States might not know about Birmingham. We might know about Birmingham, Alabama. But Birmingham yes. in the UK is the second biggest city in the UK, obviously, after London. So, it that's a pretty indeed. interesting fact. Now, were you born in Birmingham, or what's your... How does, yes. how does this work? Well, okay. I was born in Birmingham. Okay. Um, first generation... Um, uh, immigrant. My parents are from Nevis and St. Kitts in the Caribbean. Okay. Now, did your parents meet in the UK or did they meet back in the islands and they come here? No, they, they, met, they met in the UK. Okay. What did your What did your dad do for work? My dad was a delivery driver and my mom worked for British Rail for 37 years. Okay. Was she like a ticket taker or what uh, What was her? No, she used to clean the trains, funny enough. <laughs> nice, 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 nice. She used to clean the trains. Yeah, over there, you guys, uh, you guys are way more into rail than we are. You guys just, I mean, over here in the states, it's it's so big, it just doesn't make sense. But in England, it's like no. everything, everything's right yeah, there. Joe, England's a small country; it's an island. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, but its footprint is big. They yeah. say the sun never sets over the British Empire. I mean, it, it's everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. It never man. does. You're right. It never sets over the British Empire. It goes as far, east, as far east as you can go. As far south as you can go as far west as you can go now why did your parents specifically chose choosing UK and specifically chose birmingham as opposed to any other place they could have went to well if you know the history um well obviously being part of the british empire when the british decided they didn't want to pay for these little countries at the end of the second world war they needed help to rebuild the country so they invited people from the empire to come and jo join them in the motherland to rebuild the nation. So that's why they came. Okay. Because all their schooling, you know, all the schooling and all their, their laws were based on British laws and the schooling system was based on the British schooling system. So they just migrated. Okay. Now, have, now have you, we'll, we'll get into some more of that in a second, but have yeah. you been back to, uh, what is you said, St. Kitts? St. Kitts, Kitts and Nevis. Have you, have you, do you visit there often? How often do you visit back there? I know. I've only been there once. I've actually done a gig in, say, my mom's island. There's only 11,000 people in my mom's island. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like um, that. I just got back from the from the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands over the summer, and yeah, there's only okay. like 50,000, well, 30,000 people in St. Thomas. <laughs> well, I've got family in the U.S. Virgin Islands. St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. Yeah. St. Croix, St. Thomas. Yeah, St. John's. St. Martin's St. Martin is half French and half Dutch, but I've got family over them islands. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. The, man, the, the, I, I wanted to actually, I didn't get my passport here because I want to get to the, the British side of there, the British Virgin Islands. But yeah, the U.S. Virgin Islands was awesome. It was, uh, it's just, it's it's crazy because it's like, it's they don't, they didn't build any freeways. Like every road no. is like how it was back yeah. in 1920. It's like winding up and, <laughs> and hilly and, and, it, and, and they drive too. They, they take the American cars and they all yeah. drive on the left over there. It's the only... Right. Only territory in the U.S. I can I think that we have where we drive on the left because yeah. everybody and, and but it's weird though because we we use the American dollar like That's everywhere right. over there. So like you go to British Virgin Islands, you're paying with American dollars. So it's kind of That's a right. weird dichotomy they got going. I, that, that was kind of fascinating when I found all that out. That's really cool. <laughs> you drive on the wrong side of the road, you know that, don't you? Oh yeah, well that's 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 why I just take the cab. I just say just give me a cab and I'll sit in the cab and let the locals drive because I'm not trying. To <laughs> I'm not trying to figure. I'm always trying to smoke. I'm not trying to figure out and be supposed to drive this way and this way. I begin an accident. Well, so you had a Hamilton was from St. Kitts. You know to play Hamilton. The pro, mm -hmm. yeah, he was from St. He was saying from St. Kitts. And then what I found out last year was that Melanie B from Spice Girls, her grandmother was from the other side of 
it's Nevis, where my mom's from. So they all wouldn't have known each other. Okay, good deal. Yeah, no. Everybody's just right from the same old tiny ones. I love it. Video it. trivia, but you know, their family, their her family was up in Leeds. Melanie's okay. family. Her dad was born in Saint um, Nevis, but her grandmother was in Nevis. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll get smaller. Get smaller. Okay. Now, but did that, you were you uh, were you born in the sixties? When what year were you born? I was born in the sixties, late sixties. I'm a sixties child. Late okay, 60s okay. Child. So, you, so you don't you were too young to remember like the Beatles and the well, would, in their prime and all that, right? Obviously, everybody knows the Beatles, and right. I studied. I've got a master's in musicology, so if you don't know the Beatles, that's you know, that's just what it is. But no, I grew up very much like. Anybody my age, 80s child, so. Okay, so you're into the 80s rock base. You're, you're post uh, Judas Priest and Black Sabbath. and Yeah, well, they well Black Sabbath and them are from, you know, they're from the Midlands, you know. Well, Black Sabbath, Ian Gillen, <laughs> uh, Ozzy, Ozzy Osbourne and Muff, um, Steve Winwood, all them boys came from Aston. I grew up in Neitzels, which was post, you'd call it zip code, B7. Their, their zip code is B6. Oh, nice! Right next door. I like it. <laughs> so, if you go in postcode lottery, that's where we are. So, what were the some of your first coming up through through school and all that? What were some of your first bands you like jammed or when you first started getting into music? What kind of what you're well? I, to be fair, I, I started singing it. What you? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and make sure I get this right now because year year five six, I did musicals in school but then i didn't really start i, I like singing um but i didn't start getting into music until i started i mean i always loved my music i was one of the first albums i listened to and i had to listen to because my mom played it was jim reeves you know jimbo jimbo does your mama know yo jimbo jimbo <laughs> together do yo jimbo jimbo does your mama know that you're going down the road to see little girly oh <laughs> so that was the one of the first kind of influences in terms of listening but then in terms of reggae which was what i grew up with um john holt was always played bob marley obviously and then my older sisters because i'm the last of seven my sister dropped her she bought the songs in the key of life album back in 1976 77 and i spent hours and hours listening to that double album read everything on it all the musicians and just just that's that's what really got me into it and it wasn't until i got to what year years eight so i was about 14 yeah 13 14 and i met junior the drummer in the band and he him and i just hit it off because we just like li listening to our reggae music so yeah you stole one of my questions. You said you had, you're the youngest of seven. You got is it six older sisters? What's the no? I got four oldest. I got four older sisters. Two okay. older brothers. Okay. Are they all? Are they all still in uh, in England, or where did they go? Um, well, I've got my my oldest brother lives in Miami. Okay. Um, my uh, my closest brother to me, he's here in Birmingham, but he's he's married. His wife's from Miami, or she was from Birmingham, but emigrated to Miami. Um. My, one of my sisters sadly passed away, but all the others are here, so they're all in the in Birmingham. Okay, okay. Now, uh, what? Let's see here. When you was coming up, did you? Uh, were you always going to be a musician, or were you like? Did you play some sports? Did you? Uh, what was? Like, what were you doing on a normal? You know, they'd say you get off work, you get off school on Wednesday. You guys cool. are, you know, what uh, you guys generally, doing? you're right. That's a good question because I didn't know what I stumbled into being a musician. Yeah. Um, I really wanted to be a footballer. And if I wasn't going to be a footballer, I wanted to be an electrician. When I say footballer, for you, it's soccer. Soccer, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and then I wanted to be an electrician after that, if I couldn't be a... But then meeting Junior, the drummer in the band, changed all that. So I actually accidentally became a musician. Okay. Now, were you a class clown in school, or were you just kind of laid back? Or were you, <laughs> you going to see like coming up in high school? I was the type to, I would finish my work, then be the class clown. 
Okay, so work hard, play hard. I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> so, so stuff come to me quite quickly. So I'd finish, then mess about, disrupt, disrupt everybody. Okay. So what? Uh, at what point did you? It was like I read seventy nine was when you guys formed the band. How old were you when you first the band first formed? Right. And where were you? So let's get let's get this right. Seventy nine, the band formed. So this is when I met Junior, the drummer, and Patrick, his brother. So I, Junior, at the time, it was in the summer of 79, and he said, Junior came to me and said, oh, listen, my, my dad is teaching Patrick and myself to play bass. Patrick's playing bass, I'm playing drums. And he's got two other guys, two young guys, two other friends of ours, Michael and Calvin, teaching them keyboard and guitar. And we're going to form a band. And he, So I said to him, are you looking for a singer? And he said, well, yeah, we might be looking for a singer. I'll ask my dad. So... I went up to the house with him, what do we call it, Masonette, and uh, his dad said, can you sing? I said, well, I'll try. And I tried, and it, it wasn't any good. <laughs> it wasn't very good. <laughs> and um, so when the very first rehearsal happened, I wasn't singing, but I sat in on the rehearsal. And they because it was the summer holiday, they would rehearse two or three times a week. So we came back for the second rehearsal and Junior's dad, Fred Wake Sr., banned, he, he, he threw me out of the rehearsal. He said, don't come back. I don't want you in the rehearsal. So for 18 months, I couldn't go into the rehearsals, but I was outside, if you know what I'm saying. So every time I am, <laughs> every time I think about it, it's just so funny because I ended up becoming the lead singer by default because, because Junior and myself were best friends. When they needed a lead singer and the, the record company asked if because fred was singing lead and he was in his 30s and uh the record company mca at the time asked if they could well it wasn't mca it was a and m who were looking at us but anyway they asked if they could find somebody the same age as the band and that's when i stepped in okay, okay. that's exactly i stepped in in 1981 Okay, so they had the they had the they had the thirty one year old guy, you know, guy our age, relatively. He was he was lead singing, and yeah. then you stepped in right in eighty one, so like a yes. year or two before the the big yeah. hit. That's nice. So, time. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's what swung the deal for us. You see, that's what swung the deal. Now, when you guys were walking around as little kids, you know, the the band is obviously you know tweens and teens and stuff like that. Was that kind of weird going to pubs and playing in front of grown ass people? I mean, what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I suppose that's. I mean, if you think about it, most bands started in pub, in this in the UK. You speak to any of the rock bands, any of them big bands, they started playing in pubs. So that was just normal for us. Um, we played what we call the working men's clubs. You know, where that's we, we played the West Indian clubs where all the West Indians would meet, and yeah, we played a lot of them. You guys, well, what would you like? You guys like, and how long of a set would you guys do? Like an hour or so? I mean, what would you guys do? Yeah, before? so it was about at least an hour, at least an hour rehearsed for. That's the amount of songs we did at at the beginning. To ease me into it, Fred would sing his part, do his songs, and then I'd have to do my songs. Okay, so that's how it worked. And then once I got a bit more comfortable, then I stepped in full time. Now, in the early days, would you just tour, or would you just, just do any pub you could get? Or did you guys actually tour? Did you leave England at all? Did you go to Ireland or anything else? Or is all the no, UK? no. We <laughs> we only toured the UK. And when you say toured, we did gigs at the weekend. Um, because obviously, we're still at school. So it was, uh, but the, the authorities weren't watching us at the time. If you know, the education authorities never watched us at that time. It was only when the band became successful that the education authority decided to step in. Oh, tell us a little bit about that. What? Uh, how did they find out? Or I mean, obviously they knew. <laughs> how did they find out? Like, how did they find out? That's kind of a stupid question. But how did they? <laughs> what was the initial crackdown? Did they like uh, notify your mom at the house, like, "Yo, your kids no, uh, working"? No, because we never, we never left school. We never left school, Joe. We always, always at school. It was the odd occasion that we had to leave early. But once the success happened, you know, we when when the band wasn't successful, we could slip in and out of school, like miss a day here, miss a day there, and they they hadn't worked it out that why is these why are these particular boys always out 
the school at the same time because we were in all different years, year groups. So it didn't make any difference. It was only after the success that they suddenly went, oh, we notice you're missing a lot of school. <laughs> yeah, I remember one particular occasion um, when uh, we had to, the five of us had to trip to the headmaster's, your, uh, the dean's office for you and uh, speak to him. And it was the first time that the five of us had actually gone to them to say, look, we need this time off. And they were like, really? Why should we give you any time off? Uh, uh, because we're going to perform. <laughs> that was it. Now this, uh, I was reading this uh, as you guys were coming up before the song really popped, the main song, this uh, BBC One John Peel show. John now, Peel. now describe uh, describe that show for like American and Canadian you know, Canadians who may be listening, because obviously you know we're not intimately familiar with BBC One. What no. is that like a an Ed Sullivan kind of thing? What was is that like a weekly variety show? Describe that experience. Right. So let's get it right. BBC One is the TV. Okay. Radio One is the radio. So John Peel had a radio show on Radio 1 and he was the number one DJ for finding new artists. Uh, if you go to a lot of the artists throughout the late 70s, mid 70s, early 80s, if you, John Peel would have been one of the main DJs to find most of these artists, especially through the 80s. If you got played on John Peel, record companies would pick you up. So the first the first recording that music you did with Fred Wet Fred Waite singing lead singer was called Political in General. So that was 81, high unemployment, you know, it was Salt the Music Workshop. And they put it and they sent it to John and he played it. And he once he played it, that drew the attention of AM Records. They got in touch. And then it snowballed from that. Uh, we actually did two John Peel sessions. And I suppose I'm trying to think who would be the equivalent in a DJ type of thing. Uh, I mean, over, over here, like the, the DJ breaking artist kind of stopped in the 70s, 80s. Year, so that was more of a local yeah. thing, I guess, like here in Cleveland, like a Kid Leo on MMS yeah. or something like that would be the equivalent. Because yeah. back then, because we got so I mean, obviously the stage is just so spread out. You oh, can't get one that, yeah. radio signal. I mean, back they used to have the Wolfman Jack show, I think, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. They used to hit some of it, but. Yeah, by the 70s and 80s, by the 90, end of the 90s, everything was corporate. I mean, we got you to, you two or three companies on all the radio stations now. You had to syndicate, didn't you? you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, now, it's, now every 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 uh, city in the U.S. has a, you know, Mix 106 or some, yeah. you know, some generic station like that where they just play the same freaking 100 songs on loop. <laughs> which, good for you, good for you, your song comes up in on there. Yeah, yeah. Song, uh, when, I, when I told everybody I was having you on, I'm like, oh, I hear that song all the time on Mix 1065. I'm like, yep, they play it. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I've, um, yeah. So John Peel was even David Bowie. It, you know, would have been John Peel. A lot of the artists from the eighties would would tell you that John Peel played their music and it made a difference for them. So he was a very influential DJ, very very influential. So that's he played everything. So he didn't just play rock. He played a you know punk reggae hence the band got played okay now when he was but, coming up through school he touched on a little bit with you know you got attention mm -hmm. once you had to go to the headmaster and all that but at what point did it start becoming an issue with the, or did it become an issue you know with school like with your classmates and be like you know everybody just staring at like that one episode of the simpsons when bart was famous and everybody just sat there the whole class staring at him was anything like that what what what, what, no. about no? It, it, what it, joe english people are very reserved right so you go to one or two ways They'll either say something or say no, nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and our friends were split down the line. So some of them thought, ah, oh, you just show off, you know. But we decided as a band, um, we had a disastrous gig one with Fred singing uh, during the summer of 82. And uh, I mean, it was disastrous. It was just awful. The sound was bad. The band played well, but the sound was terrible. And they just teased us remorselessly. So once we recorded the single and we came back to school, we recorded the single in the summer of 82, August 82, we decided we're not going to tell anybody that we've released the single just in case it flopped. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, you know, uh, like I used to do open mics. I wouldn't tell anybody. I just go to a mic. <laughs> right. So 
we decided, right, we're not telling anybody anything, right? We're not saying anything at all. And uh, so we get back to school. So it's around this time now. Yeah, because in America, you go back to the school August. Yeah, like late August. Right around. Yeah, so we go back September, right? So we're back in school, two, three weeks, singles out. We say nothing. The five of us, nothing. And then uh, unbeknownst to us, the record company had arranged for us to be go and record the album. Yeah, the first album. Singles released. And uh, the, the charts here used to come out on a Tuesday afternoon on Radio 1. Yeah. Right. So uh, <laughs> we did a TV show. Uh, they played us on a Saturday morning children's show. Then we did a, an afternoon show on BBC called Pepper Mill at One, which was mainly for people who are at home, obviously kids are at school. And the single, the, the record company, MCA at the time, thought the single was going to go in at 84 or 55. And it went in the charts at number 26, which is a big thing here. Because that means it's direct sales. Sales have gone in. They've sold the records. It's not like downloads. Somebody's had to go to the shop at the weekend, buy the record and then count them. And then Tuesday, you get your results. So that afternoon that we were going to leave, uh, the week before, so the 20, uh, the 18th, something like that, of September, the single, the, the charts came out in the afternoon. Everybody's back in their classes, but there's a buzz going around the school. They're at number 26. That's us. But we were leaving that day <laughs> to go and record the album. So we left, you know, we finished school at half past three, left. And uh, that was it then. The week later, the single went to number one, unprecedented, went straight 25 places straight to number one. So you actually stole kind of my next question there. This, this, the song Pass the Dutchie, actually, you guys actually were, didn't want to know people or you know, know that people were, were yeah, I can't talk here. Go on. You guys didn't want people know when you were releasing this song. So you just yep. kept it hush hush and then it kept yep. on the charts. And yep. then it, it kind yep. of appeared and became popular. And then it just, that's awesome. And then it took off. Yeah. So it was like, took everybody by surprise. But the buzz around the school, because our schools aren't as big as yours. <laughs> I mean, we had, I think it was 900 people in our, in our high school. Um, so, yeah. That's crazy. Man. We got Mick says, uh, greetings from UK Musical Youth. You're huge in my day. I'm still a huge fan. Please give a shout out to Skip Rat. They influence us greatly. Skip Rat. Right. Yeah, I've never heard of Skip Rat, so I'll have to look mm -hmm. those days up, Mick. Uh -huh. Mick's a great fan of the show, Mick. All right, so the yeah. song itself. Now, the, the lyrics, when you when you heard the lyrics, what were your thoughts of the lyrics? Well, first off, who wrote the song? Who wrote Hold the song? What was my thoughts of the lyrics? <laughs> yeah, what were your thoughts of the lyrics? Right. Sure. So, let me let me give you the, the, the what what what's out there in, in open land. So Pastor Dutchie came from a song called Pastor Kutchie. Now, when the band used to do shows, we used to do reggae covers, obviously. And we used to do the number one reggae song of the time. So Mighty Diamonds released a song called Pass the Kutchie, which is a big old bong. Rasta Man Smoke, pass it to the left. And we decided when we the reggae charts came out on a Sunday. So we decided, yeah, we're going to do this one, but we're going to add something to it. And that's when we came up with This Generation Rules the Nation with Version and Calvin did his toast. And uh, we did, um, we supported Culture Club at uh, the biggest gay club in London was called Heaven. And on that day, I'll never forget it, because that day we, there was a rail and tube strike in London. So to get to London took us hours, <laughs> just hours. And if anybody's been to London, the traffic is just mad. I've heard. Okay, <laughs> right. So we get there and the place is jam packed. I think there's about 3,000 people in the venue. We're supporting Culture Club. We get to pass the Kutchi and the crowd go absolutely nuts over the song. But remember now, you got an 11 year old up to a 15 year old singing about passing a big old bong. <laughs> so the A&R the, the guy from MCA, Charlie Air says, he calls us and he says, look, this song, is there any way you can change the lyric? 
because he knew. <laughs> he knew <laughs> if he if we're gonna release this song, he's gonna, we're gonna have to do something about it. And we said, yeah, yeah, no problem. Anyway, we get to them days. You used to have to demo, do a demo of your album for the record company to have a listen. So when we went to record in Birmingham, we recorded the song once, but did the vocals twice. The first time we sang it's past the Kochi, and we literally went into the, the control room, listened to the song and said, what are we going to change the song to? What are we going to change the, you know, what are we going to change the lyric? And uh, the manager at the time, he said, said something about, I need to get home to get some food out the, the, the Dutch part, the Dutchy. And we went, Dutchy, Kochi, Dutchy. And it was just like, ding, that was it. <laughs> we were off. And we just went back in, ran the tape, Changed the literally changed Kochi to Dutchy, and then when the line comes up, how does it feel when you got no herb in the original? <laughs> we just changed it to how do you feel when you got no food? So that's where that comes in. Taking a weed song or taking a weed song and making it a cooking song. I love it. Song, yeah, All right, we got a quite wait, hold on. Dennis, whereabouts from Brum? Are you mate? I live in Wensbury. Wensbury, Wensbury, that's black country, Joe. He's in the black. They call it the black country because of all the 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 the, 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 uh, the factories used to throw out black soot. Oh, okay. Wensby, okay. Wensby's where I went to college. Okay. <laughs> they talk funny up there. Yum yum, we call them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one thing because we got a lot of randomly the show. You know, I'm obviously in Cleveland. You yeah, know, it's all because of my shirt. But randomly, yeah. we, we you know, ten percent or so of our audience was you. Know, UK just through the different channels we got. And I, I learned so much random shit about the UK. I never would have learned <laughs> anywhere else. Cause they don't teach us. I mean, everything they teach us about the UK kind of stops London. in like 1776. And then after that, <laughs> we know there's like the queen, the, 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 the Beatles and the spice girls. And that's it. That's all we know. Your spice girls. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wensbury. I have uh, the first time I went to Wensbury. This Wensbury is about from where I grew up. It's about 15 miles, right? The first time I ever went there. And I live I live just on the cusp of the black black country now. So I'm not too far from Wensby, about five miles from Wensby. So I've gone to the dark sides for me. But anyway, um they right. talk yum yum. <laughs> That's what we say. Mick writes, yeah. uh, I got your autograph outside BBC Studios and got a fine for urinating. Boy George fancy my best friend. We got a 50 quid fine for possession of two grams. Nice. <laughs> Mick's out of control. That's my buddy from Yorkshire. Mick, a shouts to Mick. Yeah. He's, he's, he's awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, so yeah, so Culture Club have a little history with us as well. It's because when after past the Dutch went to number one, we were there three weeks. Do you really want to hurt me? Went to number one after that. That's a which great is reggae influenced. Oh yeah, okay. So now, back in the day, would uh, people try to infer that the song was a weed song and just give you guys, young youngsters, weed? Like, did ever anybody ever cast your guys be like, hey, you young kids, I know you want some weed or something like that? Was, <laughs> or were you guys, were your parents just kind of like, they kept the good? Or what, what was up with that? No. So, here we go. Remember, we play reggae music. So, we spent a lot of time around Rastafarians. So, what the Rastafarians smoke? Oh, yeah. Weed. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny that we were around it. But... No, nah, nobody tried to force it on us. No. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, our manager was very strict on that. So, well, I mean, at the end of the day, too, most, uh, I'm a pothead, obviously, anybody knows the show knows this, but, you know, most, most potheads are, we're very cordial and nice, and we're not going to, you know, it's not like we're trying to make a billion oh, dollars yeah. off the pot. We just want to get high. And I mean, we're not going to try to force some kid to get high. Yeah, I mean, that's just the way it goes with weed, man. <laughs> no. Yeah, I don't have a problem with weed, I, you know. Good you got you got to come over here to the states and try some of this weed, man. It's, it's, no, it's, I tried yeah. it. When I, was younger. I tried it when I was younger. When I was when I was twenty, I lived in Los Angeles. So this was when it wasn't legal, and the smug in Los Angeles was a lot of weed. <laughs> oh yeah, well California is kind of the weed capital of the whole uh, whole world if you think about it. Yeah, the and first then, ones to get the legal or uh, what's it called medicinal back in '96, and then right. you know going. They say going to California now, you just, it's like you just a touch screen, you just buy it. It's like going to the Apple store. It's a little, <laughs> well, it's I just come back. I just came back from Los Angeles two weeks ago. I was out doing some shows. Okay. I, yeah. went, I mean, I've been to LA in a hot minute. I talked to a lot of guys out in LA because we mm -hmm. talked a lot of entertainers and shit. I haven't been to LA in probably 17 years at least. Yeah. 
those are the other ones. I went to Beverly Hills for a little bit and uh yeah. Hollywood. Hollywood itself is such a dope man. You don't you don't realize that until you go there. It's just like I know <laughs> why is there a liquor store right here? Why is there a pawn shop? I thought this is supposed to be the land of glitz and glamour, and there's a freaking liquor store and a homeless guy sitting right there. What's up with that? <laughs> I know, I know. I, well, I was living there when I was as I say, 20. I spent my 21st birthday there. And you guys don't mix your weed with cigarettes, you just have it straight. Oh, yeah, you see, here in this country. They mix it with cigarettes. Okay. We call that so, spliff. Yeah. Some, sometimes they do it in jail. They do it a lot. Like if you go to get yeah. jailhouse weed, I guess. But yeah, in the street, weed, I mean, weed's so cheap. You can get ounce for a freaking 50, 60 bucks of decent shit. Mm. I mean, it's, it's uh, the price drops. So it's, some places in Oregon, it's like 20, 30 bucks an ounce. It's, uh, yeah. The price is just so ridiculously cheap and it's so strong, too, man. It just really hooks it up, man. I like when it. When I got to, when I got to 17, 18, when I used to come off stage, I couldn't roll up. I, I didn't learn to roll up because I didn't want to have the habit. I didn't want to get, caught up but i used to my i took our roadie used to roll me up one and it used to make me sleep because i couldn't at 17 you come off stage your adrenaline is just oh yeah oh yeah and this thing just used to calm me down but then i yeah i just stopped all right so so now the uh the video let's get into the video on this here (laughs) i I, i'm not gonna lie i've never this is weird because i've heard the song a thousand times i've never seen the video until earlier today seriously it, it was kind of uh it's kind of like it was cool going on like a time machine because i appreciate the you know the early 80s production values i can imagine the uh yeah, no, and the cool. giant cameras going around yeah, now first cool. off do you remember much of that day of the video yeah i remember we had to get i remember we had to get there early because <laughs> like, I, I, i've been told videos could take like 14 16 hour days you remember yes. how long that day took to yes. film that? listen by the time we finished it was dark yeah. Oh, geez, you started probably six in the morning and went all the way. No, no, the- we start. We were out there about between eight and nine, and then the, the part where, at the very beginning where you see the box come up. Mm-hmm. That's after we'd carried it about three hundred foot. <laughs> I'll say you guys do the labor for the video. That's great. <laughs> and then, obviously, you had to retake and retake and retake and retake. Yeah, so it's all natural. I mean, that's that's Lambeth. The Houses of Parliament is behind us, and we're actually on Lambeth Bridge. Okay. And uh, I said that earlier, it was on Lambeth Bridge. In, in yeah, the Lambeth line. Bridge. And we had to go to the to go to the the bathroom. We had to go to Lambeth Palace because there was no bathroom around there. So we had to go walk down and go to Lambeth Palace, and we got changed there on the side of the road. <laughs> no makeup. Can, can you give there you guys no a makeup. dressing room or a, a porta potty or what the? F- <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't a porta loo. <laughs> no porta loo. <laughs> All right, we got questions. Says, uh, Dennis, if the guys did this in the USA, it wouldn't work. Do you think the reggae culture is unique and misunderstood today in the UK? The scene is bigger than ever. Forget about U40. UB40, <laughs> my local heroes. <laughs> you know, now um, the the scene, the, the reggae scene is. I think it's bigger in the US. Obviously, there's more people. Um, the reggae scene here is taking a bit of a battering. So, in, in answer to that question, yeah, it's taking a bit of a Bosh, 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 bosh. Yeah, Mick is saying the uh, influence you had is happening now rather than back then. So nice. Maybe you got some. Uh... Yeah, I get to understand that. And the internet has made that and people contacting us. And when we do shows, you know, I'm the last. Apart, well, my Michael's in Canada now. But yeah, when we do shows, I, to be fair, Joe, when we, we set out as a band, we never set out to have a number one single. We set out to be as good as we could be. And be, you know, and doing what we do, and we just wanted to encourage other young guys to play music, any music, so they could see the enjoyment we have, you know. Even though we turned out to be the same rock and roll story as anybody else, but yeah, I mean, we were always having fun. You, you know, you're 15, 16, traveling around the world, first class with your mates, with your best friends. Who's not gonna have fun? Rockstar <laughs> life, dude. Rockstar life. That's what I'm talking about. Pick up and go. Where are we going? We're going on tour, bitches. Let's do this. I love it. Yeah. I love the it. unfortunate thing is, our, our touring got curtailed because of the education. Because when the education got involved, um, we had to. I remember sitting in the room with the, our parents and the edu- head of the education department in Birmingham, and uh, they told us, "Look, um, legally, we can only let you work 42 days a year." That's legally. So 42 days a year to do everything. That's Record, not that's, that's video. Month. That's not barely over a month. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually, 
we actually broached the subject of emigrating to the US so we could further our career, but the parents wouldn't allow it. Um, my mom was a single parent, so she just said, look, as long as you're happy, I'm happy. And they never came with us. So we always had to be in the same, on the same floor, you know, and the chaperones, when we say chaperones, it was our manager, tour manager, road manager, they had to look after us. Right, right. We got a, we got a nice comparison here. It says musical use was, was the UK's answer to the Jackson 5 only reggae version. True. So well, like, solid comparison. I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, slight different, the slight difference is that we played instruments. Right, and the Jackson people. Five just danced and sang around. <laughs> and I couldn't dance, <laughs> as you can see. I couldn't dance. <laughs> you know, it's why I, I can. As much as people think I might have rhythm myself, but, you know, I'm a soul soul brother. I'm, I have no rhythm at all. I can't dance for shit either. I just I go like this and just get behind a chick I want to grind up on. That's one, that's my own dance. Group. <laughs> so. Yes. So is it true that you guys were the first uh, black artist to be on MTV or in studio? Or what was the, the yeah. milestone so, there? Um, here's how it goes. We didn't know this, but obviously it comes to light later. Um, MTV was mainly a rock station. And obviously every 30, every 30 rock videos, they play, a, they play Michael Jackson, who had to bet his record label had to force them to play Michael. But for some reason... They picked up on Pastor Dutchy and played it and played it. And then we were, we'd gone to Jamaica to record two videos. Uh, Youth of Never Gonna Give You Up and Heartbreaker. But once we'd done that, we flew from Jamaica to New York in February. So we'd gone from 40, 42 degrees to minus eight <laughs> <laughs> out of the oven into the freezer. Oh, yeah. And they actually took us into the studio to record uh, an interview. We didn't know. We didn't know the brouhaha or what was going on. And we just went and did, we just said that, it's another TV, it's, you know, just another TV interview. So we just went and did it. And it's only when we look back in history that we realized that we were the first black artists to go into MTV studios and do an interview. And they played past the Dutchie without any, any provocation from us or the record label. They just played it, which kind of helped the band get to America. And then we did Saturday Night Live as well. Oh, nice. SNL. Good deal. I didn't know you guys did Saturday Night Live. Good shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Saturday Night Live. Who was the, uh, who was the host then? Um, Joan right? Rivers was the host. Oh, nice. Nice. Did, uh, did, any any memories of Joan Rivers? Did she have yeah. like a giant makeup crew in the back with the... She did, but our makeup was, we'd go in the makeup room and they'd look at us and go, you're fine. Don't <laughs> 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 be wrong. Cool. Let's get on with it. <laughs> now, New York back then, man, do you remember how uh, was it? I mean, I would talk to a lot of guys from New York, too, obviously. There's, it's pretty sketchy back then. As kids, what were uh, you guys well, freaking out, walking around Times Square with all the hookers and pimps and prostitutes? <laughs> what was going on? Well, no. I mean, you got to imagine they, they're going to make sure we're looked after. Um, we never went down. We went to Times Square, but in the middle of the day. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, I mean, I went back at 17 and went down 42nd Street and saw the uh, the vices of... <laughs> you see, unlike the US, once you get to eight, 17, 18 in the UK, you can drink your alcohol. No, Nobody's asking for ID. In America, unless you got ID, you're not... And yet, if you look under 21, you're not getting anything unless you, are, you, got, you show your ID. Oh, there's some people... There's some gas stations there. Like if you're under 40 cart, I went to, I don't drink anymore, but I still buy these cigarillos. And yeah. now, now the smoking age is, is 21. And there's this one gas station. They're like, okay, that's the idea. I was like, you're not going to ask me for ID. I got gray hairs. I got two kids out in the car. Fuck out here with your ID. I they actually changed the policy. I complained about it on Facebook. And two months later, that store, they don't, they yeah. didn't have that policy anymore. Cause I was, I was pointing out how ridiculous it is. I was like, yeah. I, can buy, I can buy these things within five. There's five stores within a mile. I could buy these. I'm not going to show ID. It's a waste of my time and waste yeah. of your time. And you know it. They, they backed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So New York. Yeah. I love New York. That's. Yeah. yeah New York's changed a lot, man. I was, I was just over there this summer, man. It's uh, you can walk to any time of the day. It's no big deal at all. They, weed's legal there now too. So I was just outside the hotel puffing away. Nobody gave a shit. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Right, I, haven't been, I haven't been since 2001. Okay. Okay. I was actually giving you that. I got a question about that later. Uh, Mick yeah. writes, as a white band enjoying black culture and music and being influenced by UK variation of regional sounds, I and we as a band, thank you, bro. 
Camden Sound to Sheffield is different. Okay. Yeah, true. Controversial. Oh, here we go. Here's a question from Cyrus. Controversial, possibly, but do you think the UA, UK education authorities would have been more lenient to a white band? <laughs> I don't know. I just, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if Lena Zavaroni, which she was a young artist at the time, I don't know if she got pulled at all. I can't say. I'd have to go and have a look. I mean, I was going to... When I, when I did my study, I was going to, I'm going to do a PhD probably on young artists and what, what went on. And that probably would be a factor in it as well. You don't know. I mean, it's 40 years ago, so I suspect it could have been, but you know, they, they put the markers on us. That's for sure. They didn't help our career. Now, do you think that the band with the hit coming so young, do you think you guys rose too fast or do you think uh, it was just, that's a question that's been brought for the last 40 years. Who knows? We were entering to the unknown. I mean, if I look over 40 years, there, there's never been a band like Music of Youth since because it was so organic. Right, right. And when I say organic, it wasn't, you know, put together in terms of we're going to get him from there, him from there. It was two brothers, two brothers and me. And nobody expected it to do what it did. We never expected to have a number one single. Yet, a, yet alone a worldwide hit single. We never set out for that. Remember, I said we decided we're not telling anybody anything. <laughs> that was right, our decision. Right. Yeah. So once it's there, you've now got to deal with it, and you, you got to imagine our parents, their thought process. We didn't have internet. We didn't have mobile phones. We didn't have playstations. We had conversation, music, conversation, music, sleep, eat, and drink. Girls, maybe, but that was it. Um, and if you think about it, even when we had our celebration of party for number one, the cheapest number one party ever, no girls, <laughs> no drugs, <laughs> hardly any alcohol, <laughs> but we got Kentucky and McDonald's <laughs> and apple pies. Hey, what more do you want? <laughs> Hey, them apple pies are banging when you're a kid, man. I tr yeah. Trust me, I'd say, I still fuck with some McDonald's apple pies. <laughs> the apple pies I still have my apple pies now. Oh, I know, man. I might get one after the show, actually. <laughs> now, do you, the, what led to the, uh, the the band initially breaking up? What was the ultimate downfall, would you would you, you personally say? Not what actually me happened. Personally, you personally. Right. So for me, um, we'd been on tour to Jamaica, 85. Patrick took sick. So he had to stay in Jamaica because he had a mental breakdown. And then I came back and there was some wind, you know, because two families are going, my son's a musical youth if they leave. Yeah. Then the other two are saying, if we leave, that's musical youth. And then I was like, well, where does that leave me? So I decided, you know what? I got to 18. I got, I gave my life to Christ at the time. And uh, before we'd gone on tour and I said, you know what? I'm not happy. And instead of somebody, if I had somebody to pull me aside and say, you need to take a break, you all need to take a break because it's been a whirlwind three years, yeah? Right. right. Um, nobody advised us. And I just thought, if I'm not happy, I can't do this. It's going to do me in. So I just stepped down. And that was it, personally. I didn't expect the band to do, to, you know, to disband again. I expected him to go and, you know, most bands would go and look for another lead singer, wouldn't they? Right, right, right. And, uh, that never happened, unfortunately. So, yeah, that was my personal side of it. It's a number of things. Uh, the management, as I look back on it now as an adult and a father, the manager was, <laughs> yeah, he didn't, he didn't help the situation um, because the two of the parents had lost faith in him. And I know why now as an adult, um, but that, and also it was just all disjointed. There was no leadership, nothing. So at 18, you think you know things, but you don't know nothing. But I made that decision and I stand by that decision. I'm here tell, talking to you with that decision. So. Right, exactly. Look, look, still, you got you got gold records on the wall. I ain't got no gold <laughs> records on my wall. So something something went right in your life, my friend. That's, went right that's, one, that's a Grammy nomination over my head there. Oh, just, nice. Uh, oh, they give, actually give you a, 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 a plaque for a nomination too. That's cool. Yeah. I, know, right? I mean, cool. if you, the, the thing about that, Joe, that nomination, there was no reggae artist that at the time. So we were nominated as best newcomers alongside Eurythmics, 
culture club, big country. <laughs> you know, who, and who won uh, that award? Was sorry, culture club? culture club won that one. Nice, culture club's got great band. I, I love culture club. I gotta listen to some of them later, too. I mean, we did, I mean, the band at the time didn't realize how big the Grammys were. Seriously, until oh, until until we got to the award ceremony, <laughs> yeah, and everybody and their dogs there. So, Red, uh, who who? Well, uh, that's that's actually a cool question. I never thought about that. When you went to was it eighty four? You was at the Grammy? Oh yeah, eighty four. So it was uh, was Michael there? Madonna? Michael who won eight Grammys that day. Woo! That was, was, that was that a thriller album, boy. That nice. was the thriller album. Nice. Yeah, we spent we drove we drove from Laguna Beach to. Shrine Auditorium, watching the making of Thriller in the back of the limousine. Oh, nice. And the year before, we recorded the second album in Los Angeles. Michael, we went to we went to the Jackson's house. We went to Michael's house in Encino with his family. And he showed us the, M- the Motown 25 video before it was released. Nice. And we were like, we were like, whoa. And all he said was, we asked him what you're going to do next. And he said, I'm just going to do a a video, one more video for th- for the album Thriller because I like horror movies. That's all he said. <laughs> nice. And then he comes out with probably, I would say, arguably, you know, if not the best music video of all time. Yeah, it's yeah, totally yeah. amazing. You love Trust that me. video. Trust That's me. Awesome. So, we, you know, he's showing us history there. He's showing us history. So yeah. we, had a, we had a great time. That's cool. Now, did you keep in contact with the – the guys who survived, you know, throughout the nineties and all that, or what? Uh, yeah, how- I mean, to be fair, when I left the band, I went to New York for a couple of weeks, and then I came back and I, I lived in London, and um, I ended up. That's when I ended up in Los Angeles for a year. I went out there to record with Stevie, but I, I didn't speak to nobody in the band um, for a good while, a long time. I mean, I didn't speak to Michael for about ten years. But at the, I mean, you think about it, 10 years, I was only 18, <laughs> so I hadn't got right, to 30 right. yet. But I'd spent a, a good amount of time with uh, out in Los Angeles. Um, I got signed to Island Records by Chris Blackwell and uh, went out to Los Angeles and Stevie Wonder record, recorded with Stevie Wonder a couple of songs. Nice. He produced a couple of songs for me and sang on there. And then came back, signed to an independent label, and the whole thing recorded an album, solo album, which as I listened to it, I'm like, it's all over the bloody place. <laughs> but what I was trying to steer clear of was going down the musical youth route. But really, again, if somebody would have said, look, why are you running from your your culture? Mm. That's you. You know, you're a reggae artist and you just accept it. And and then I put together a band in Birmingham for local musicians and we just gigged the gigs in pubs, clubs, pop, whatever. And, um, got to speak to Michael. Eventually Michael set up his own production company. I did speak to Calvin. Um, junior wasn't fit. I taught before I got to LA, I'd spent six months in Southern Ireland doing shows I was supposed to do some shows with Michael and Patrick and Junior, but they weren't well enough. So I had to go on my own with a, a local band. And we ended up staying there for six months, Southern Ireland. Okay. Touring. <laughs> I, mean, I spent some time. Oh, I spent, I, I lived in Ireland in 99. Okay. Uh, me, me and my dad vacationed there for a week. Ireland's a cool country, man. They, uh, <laughs> yeah. the thing, thing that fascinates me about Ireland is like here in the States, you know, people go to work, you know, they usually happy hour starts. The party doesn't really get going until later. In Ireland, dude, they start. <laughs> Right as soon as the bar opens, it's packed and they just drink all day. They drink all day. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. It was all day. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can imagine, and you you wouldn't recognize this, but in 86, I was there, right? So there's parts of Ireland that black people had never been. And yeah, they only seen black people on the TV if they were lucky. Yeah. So touring was great because I lived three months in Dublin. And just had the best time. Had the best time. <laughs> are you are you a drinker? What kind of uh, beers? No, are you? No. I mean, back then, uh, the, the only that's where I learned to drink my Guinness. Okay, yeah, Guinness is Guinness isn't a, isn't a bad beer at all. It's uh, here in the states. St. Patrick's Day is just obviously. Oh, just I know. <laughs> so I we know. Crazy Joe. with the Guinness on St. Patrick's Day. Oh, we got we had some questions here from the, yeah. uh, the audience. Here it says, "Who or what artist inspired you the most from Wichita?" Um, this. Well, Stevie's one, 
my hero, and Bob Marley was the other. Hey, how was it working with Stevie? Is he a funny guy? Is he humorous? Yeah, or? No, Stevie, Stevie's all about fun. <laughs> Stevie's all about fun. I met Stevie when I was 15, 16. You know, um, we got, we were recording the second album and we went down to his radio station and somebody said, do you want to meet Stevie? Do we want to meet Stevie? <laughs> yeah, I'll ask yeah. to meet Stevie. <laughs> Fuck it, eh? <laughs> anyway, three o'clock in the morning, we get the call. <laughs> Stevie's at the studio now. Three o'clock. Think about this now. Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Cold wake. Hey, you Stevie know. Wonder's here. Major guys, come on out. 16. Uh, all right. I guess we can put a, get out of our jammers and put on our blue jeans. We're going to see so Stevie. We, 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 get down, we get down to Wonderland and Stevie's there. It's bright as day because obviously he doesn't know the time of day, but right, right. <laughs> He was, he, he's been a friend ever since and a good friend too. All right. We got a question from Mick. Uh, he says, yeah, you might have to translate some of this because I don't know what this UK speak is. But he says, Dennis, no BS. Best goat curry in UK is where? And plantain. I'm up north. So leads oh, for me. Leads. Take away well, now. Well, cooking. I suppose it's going to be in Chapel Town. Any, I don't know the restaurants in Chapel Town. I only know the restaurants in Birmingham. So. All right, yeah. so Chapel, Chapel Town or Chapel, yeah, Town. Chapel Town. If he's in Leeds, Chapel Town is where he's going to go because I got family there. Okay. Gonna go to Chapel Town and just find a West Indian restaurant. All yes. right, good deal. Curry good goat, deal. not goat curry. Curry goat, Mick. Curry goat. Curry <laughs> goat. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, no, explain what curry goat is. It sounds uh, interesting. It's a dish. It's curry. It's curry. It's listen. In they call it curry goat because in the in the West Indies, it's goat they cook, but it's tough meat. In the UK, we don't have goat. We have it's mutton, which is an old sheep. Okay, and you have to cook it down, and it's stewed, and yeah, curry goat and rice. That's do, that's do, you, do you particularly enjoy this or no? Of course, of course. Okay. Okay. Especially out of the Dutch pot. Okay, nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, I get. Yeah, the the uh, it's weird because like the UK, they're not known for you know. Oh, this is a great you know English food or whatever. You know, people are like oh, it's bland or whatever. But if you get some of that, you know, the Caribbean influence in it, it can really pop. I mean, I, I fuck yeah. with some Caribbean food. like Jamaican jerk chicken is so is so good. Yeah, there, there's this place in Cleveland they make jerk chicken nachos. Yeah. I love it, man. I want to yeah. get some of those now. I should really get food before I get doing on the show because I'm hungry as hell now. No, <laughs> I, I read that you guys you uh, were gonna tour right after 9-11 and then uh, 9-11 happened. Where were you uh, during 9-11 and then what was the first tour date like supposed to be? Explain all that. Okay, so we signed up to an 80s tour that uh, autumn and uh, it wasn't it wasn't 9-11. It was the uh, the Iraq war, the Iraq war, I think it was, that caused everybody to jump down. Okay. Yeah. And 9-11... I can remember I was working at a car rental company and seeing it when I heard, I'd heard a, an airplane had struck one of the towers and having been on the t up at the World Trade Center earlier that year, I remember standing there looking down at uh, Liberty Island and seeing the planes flying through. So I thought, well, like light aircraft has hit the, what? And then when we turned on the TV, to watch the horror, it was like, wow, just something else, you know? So unbelievable, unbelievable. It's just like, even now I'm just, because I remember going underneath the World Trade Center and I was just thinking about, wow, all them people underneath the World Trade Center, not just up there. So that just threw me. Yeah, because all them, a lot of them transits in New York, like London, it's very uh, heavily, like you guys call them tubes, but the subway there yeah, is tubes, popular. Subway, yeah. Everybody comes in. No, nobody drives in New York because it's right. too expensive. <laughs> You don't need to. Yeah. Like I, when I, when I, I stayed in New York, it was like uh, at the hotel, it was like thirty dollars a day just to have your car there. I mean, I paid it because it was, you know, <laughs> where well, because if I would if I would have parked in New Jersey and taken the train over, done all that, it's still have been about the same amount of money. So I was like, yeah. you know, what are you gonna do? You know, yeah. It's just how New York is. So it's, uh, it's not car friendly. It's just how, no, you know, it's not. It's not designed like that. Now, have you seen uh, the Wedding Singer? Yes. <laughs> okay, that, that's no, that's the first time I got really rekindled with the song because I remember exactly. it, you know, back in the day a little bit. But I'll tell you what, man. After the wedding singer came, that song mm -hmm. really started popping. Now, did do you uh do you watch it? Nah, do you watch a movie a lot? But did you notice a resurgence of the song? You know, the past the Dutch song after that movie, or was kind of just whatever for you after you know ninety seven going forward? Um, well, no. Um, I mean, it was. The wedding singer that caused us to go back to our record company and check out what was going on with our royalties, to be fair. Um, and what we discovered was a horror. Um, and I know for the, the the soundtrack was the best selling soundtrack of that year, The Wedding Singer. Yeah, about it. Um, and then it went from there to 
it was in Scooby Doo. So Scooby Doo, give us a little props. And you did ask me earlier who wrote the song. We had a oh, we had a big court case with this uh, because obviously we had to change the lyric. It's on record for forty years that we had to change the lyric, and we approached. We found out that uh, lawyer. <laughs> didn't represent us he represented all the other people because there was 11 people claiming the song but they wouldn't give us any of the publishing and we're, we we are not happy about it because we weren't asking for all we were just asking for our little share you know just because we changed the lyric and that was it you know as i tell you this i say it's a story as i tell you how is it how it went when we changed the lyric it was simple as that we just went from kochi to dochi and all you have to say to some and and remember change herb to food you just say, look, we'll give you that much. Not a problem, but yeah, um, and that's just the sore point. But it's gone now, it's there. You just got to live with it. Right, right. End of the day, you know, it's a life advice for everybody. If something happens, you can't change it, oh, well, move on. You know, yeah. Nothing yeah. to worry about. You know. you, your record company doesn't pay you for 18 years. Well, and then they pay you for six. Well. <laughs> right, wait, what can you do? It's not like we have a DeLorean here. We can go back in time. No. And, back to and then, uh, you know, you got the contract that says they're going to exploit you. And they're still exploiting. <laughs> if you don't keep your if you don't keep your eye on them, they'll just keep taking and taking and taking. Right. I mean, oh. I mean, think think about how crazy how, how crazy and effed up the music industry is when you you know you can't go if you listen to you know Mix One Hundred Six or any mix station in your local town. I guarantee you, in a twenty four hour period, they're going to play past the Duchy. You Seriously? know. And, yeah. And I mean, and if you think about you know, say the police, they're going to play the police or something. I guarantee you, Peter Gabriel is getting a lot more money than, you know, Dennis Seaton right now. <laughs> Let's just put that way. It's all fucked up. Joe, 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 let's take small mercies. At least I'm getting some. Right, right. Something's better than nothing. Something's better than right. nothing. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm here telling you the tale. So. Now, do you do you like touring? Tour? I, I would love to tour every now and then. But does it ever get old? Or do you, like, at this point in your life, you're just touring? It's kind of like what, like what you No, create. I mean, here's the thing, Joe. When I left the band, I, I gigged with my band. But my whole, what I, once once the original music was there and we did shows, we did shows in St. Croix, we did shows in Japan, um, live shows in Thailand, US, we did New York and LA. When we did our shows in America at that time, we used to do two shows. So we used to do a matinee show for the young kids our age <laughs> and kids didn't go to live gigs then. And then for the adults, um so yeah we did reggae sun splash we did shows in barbados you know st croix st thomas st martin st kitts uh, we went to africa we did shows in uh, nigeria we did one hundred and ten thousand people in ghana one hundred ten thousand yeah. people was that the biggest crowd you guys did that the was the biggest crowd, crowd yeah. and 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 we 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 got a song on the second album called um oh seven you know james bond but in there, it's got a, it's got a, a call answer back saying a shanty town, and when we did Kumasi, December twenty sixth, nineteen eighty five, yeah, that is the biggest tribe in Kumasi, the Ashanti tribe. So we had to sing the song twice, and it was in a football stadium, and they wouldn't let us out. <laughs> they just locked the gates and said, "You're not coming out. Go back and sing." Nice. <laughs> Now that now Ghana's the Gold Coast. That was back man, when, when you got off. Do you have any memories of like a bunch of cool gold shit when you were walking around Ghana? Or no, what? no. <laughs> I was picturing well, they, they brought you in on like an elephant with a gold chalice or something. What, what I what I will tell you, what I will tell you, is that uh, there's a couple of things. So at the time of going to Ghana, it was Christmas, so we flew out New Year, Christmas Eve. It's the only time I've ever spent Christmas outside of the UK. So myself, Patrick, and Junior, we went. We had Jackie Mitu from the Scatterlights playing with us and uh, a local band supporting. And we spent Christmas Day traveling to a place called Kamasi. I'd never known. And um, the people were so lovely. But at the same time, that time of the year, they were expecting a military coup. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and immigration was uh, lax to say this least. So somebody whispered, give me a little a little birdie said in my ear, look, if you, because I used to carry my, my cassettes and my, my, my Walkman in my, my briefcase. And somebody said to me, listen, when you go through immigration, if they open up your briefcase, 
and say, can I have that? Because what he said, whatever you put in your suitcase, your briefcase, your hand luggage, make sure you are willing to give it away. Yeah, because if you don't, you're going to have trouble. So anyway, <laughs> we're coming out of the country and um, they check you. Right. So they open up my briefcase and they look at me and go, the, 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 the soldier's gun says, uh, is that your cassette? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I have it? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Give <me a> cassette. <laughs> so there's about 12 of us. He said, who's with you? I said, them 11. He went, you 11? Go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All for the price of one freaking $10 cassette yeah. you couldn't get a penny for now at the record exchange. I love it. <laughs> Cassettes. For those I love of you it. Yeah, but I'll, I'll go on record. I say is cassette is my... VCR tapes and cassette tapes are my least favorite technology of all time. They, you would buy them, and then, you know, two days later, they'd be in the boombox all scattered up. You'd be trying to take a pencil and tape it up. And, uh, Even mini disc is better than that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> E-track and freaking records are better than that. Ah, jeez. <laughs> but, yeah. So, yeah. Um, we never, ever got to do a full world tour. Remember I said about the education? Right, right. That's what curtailed us, you know. Okay. And when we did our TV shows, we had to apply three weeks before the TV show. Yeah. And if you no, think about the orders, couldn't just take out. Nowadays, they parents would just take out of school or homeschool and just do whatever. You go. That's right. So that's, if somebody said, what's your one regret? That was it, really. We never got to tour the world. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm here trying to get, to, I want to do, we did Japan. We did Tokyo and Osaka. And it was great. Thailand was great with the soldiers standing at the side with their things. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's allowed to stand up. If they get excited, you can't stand up. <laughs> they have to sit down, sit down. We did um, the Montreal Jazz Festival. A lot of people don't realize we did the Montreal Jazz Festival. Has headlined that. Okay. Um, okay. July tenth, nineteen eighty three. Yeah, had a great time. What was your favorite out of all them countries to tour? What was your favorite? Maybe maybe that's a bad question because you didn't get the world tour. What was your favorite gig, would you say, you guys got to do? The favorite place you performed? You know what? I enjoyed all our gigs, to be fair. I, I remember the ones you remember, you know, Sons, Reggae Sunsplash in Jamaica, because obviously it's the home of reggae music. Right. Um, in all honesty, Joe, we weren't overawed by any of these um, festivals. All we did was rehearsed, be, rehearsed more when we knew we were coming up to these gigs, we rehearsed and made it tight. So when you see the band, that's the band playing live. So doing Saturday Night Live, we didn't realize how big Saturday Night Live is was. Do you know what I mean? Right. So oh, yeah. It's it's it. People see it now and go, "Oh, Saturday Night Live, boom, boom, boom." We did it when it was in its early years, just so it didn't it didn't it didn't rile us. After all, I suppose the Reggae Sun Splash would be one of the highlights. I've never been to Jamaica. I'll have to check it out. I'll have to check out Jamaica. Because going to the Virgin Islands, man, I really dig the island vibe, man. I really dig the yeah, ocean yeah. waves and just chilling. And, <laughs> and, and nothing really matters. Everybody's just like, whatever, let's do this. And, you know, yeah, it's just yeah. uh, it's a cool vibe, man. I fuck with it a lot. <laughs> now, besides, yeah, no. obviously, the, the Dutchie songs, is there any songs that you've done or your you know your band have done? Anything you've been involved with over the years you think should should have gotten more pop or, you, you know, you're, you're personally proud of? Maybe it didn't, you know, Listen, success to radio play or something like that? What, what you got to remember is that the record company was probably one of the biggest. It's now Universal. MCA changed its brand into Universal, right? So they've got a reggae band that's very successful all over the world, but they don't know what to do. <laughs> they don't know what to do with it. So the second album had a big reggae, um, well, it was reggae, but it was American influence on it. We had Wah Wah Watson on that album. You know, we sung, I mean, Donna Summer, Unconditional Love. That helped Donna Summer career back. And we did some live shows with Donna as well. So that was great. Um, Michael and myself got back together 10, 15 years ago to go and do some shows. And, and we just just gelled, just fitted like a It's like old slippers, you know. Right, right, right. Get <laughs> the band made together. Hell yeah. And it was just, you know, Michael would tell you, we had the, we, we just, when we, we, we toured, we did, a show, we did some shows uh, in the West Coast. And it's called the Great British Reggae Explosion. So we took a we had a band called Reggae Revolution from Birmingham, and they support they backed us, Michael and myself, and Apache Indian. Okay, so <laughs> Apache Indian had a, a you know boom shakalak, and he was we were out in out there, and 
me and Michael just had the best time because it was just like, you know, slippers and gloves. And then um, Michael got married. And when he had his first child, I said, that's it. Because I, I didn't tour because I wanted to watch my kids grow up. Right, right. If I if I'm away, I can't watch my kids grow up. So I decided I'm not going to tour. The longest tour I did was that US tour. But now my kids are, all, you know, then the youngest is 19 and at university. So I'm back. I mean, I say I'm back. I've been doing gigs constantly for the last how many years. And so my goal now is to do parts of America that I never played. You know, I've done the West Coast. I want to. You got to come to the Midwest, dude. I'll tell yeah. you what, man. I want to come. So you got to come. If you you, you got to come to Cleveland. You hit me up. I got you on everything. <laughs> I will get you. together. But yeah, so we 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 recorded. Two other albums. The other album's called um, "Legal Now," because obviously, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. back then you were illegal. Right. And then uh, we just recorded an album, uh, and I say just, it's been released called uh, "When Reggae Was King," and uh, that was based on I, I I went to university at thirty seven to go and study music because I had a car rental company and I sold it and I thought, I don't want to go and do that no more. I want to go, I don't want to go and work for anybody. I'm going to go and do what I want to do. Oh, so yeah. I went and studied and got my master's in musicology. So uh, I, uh, during that time of putting together my project, I came up with this concept of when reggae, was, I was reading a book called When Reggae Was King. And it's about this country. We, we've got a long history 50 years of reggae music being in the top 40, top 20, and from 1960, whatever, reggae music formed early 70s, reggae as we know it, so the Bob Marley's of this world, the Jimmy Cliffs, you know, Harder They Come was the film that put reggae into the mainstream. I mean, John Holt then had a thousand volts of Holt. And uh, my concept was, I don't want to do a project that I can't use, take it out into the real world. Because when you do university stuff, it stays in the, you just throws it and done. I right. want to carry it on. So I was very keen to move this on. So when reggae was king was based on the concept of the songs were influential to us listening to them because they're, they're artists that we, we looked up to. They were our peers. So we recorded songs by Jimmy Cliff, um, Toots and the Maytals and Toots, Tootsie Hibbert just passed away this year. Uh, John Holt, Bob Marley, we did, um, and we just, we just done the video for it. I shot the sheriff. Yeah, so we've just done the video. We're just waiting for it to clear now. Okay, nice. Um, so nice. It's gonna, the record company out there, Thump, Thump Records, I should say, not Trump, Thump Records, have released it, and they're just waiting for clearance to, to, to put the video to it. Then we did I'd Love You To Want Me, Front Door by Gregory Isaacs, Money in My Pocket. And these songs, Money in My Pocket was a hit in this country. Um, Good Thing Going, which is a Motown classic by the corporation, but it was taken to number four in the charts here. So all the songs, there's only one song that, and then we did Youth of Today, and we've done a new version of Past the Duchy as well. So we got Past the Duchy Lockdown version 2020. Nice. I right, got a question from Mick. It says, Dennis, do you think the American culture of rap overshadowed the reality of the English reggae scene? Um, yes. <laughs> That's the question. See, you say that. When I was living in Los Angeles back in 1980, 87, 88, right? I went to a showcase. And after the showcase, I went to dinner with the head of a at the time for Island Records, a girl named Kim Buey. And... Uh, she said, "You got to come with me to." I said, "I didn't know what we were doing." Anyway, we go to we go to this Italian restaurant, and uh, we spend two hours, right? And uh, the guy sitting opposite me, his name's Dr. Dre. <laughs> the guy sitting next to me, his name's Easy E. The guy next to the left was Cuban Mello. <laughs> nice. It was NWA. <laughs> so I spent two hours in the company of NWA just before they released Straight Outta Compton. Nice. And, Kim spent, she was trying to sign them to Island Records and Kim, <laughs> Kim, <laughs> she kept asking what does NWA stand for and they wouldn't tell her. <laughs> and when we come out of the restaurant, she looked at me when she went, Dennis, I know it stands for no whites allowed. I know that's what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> I know it stands for. And, and Kim's like a hippie. <laughs> so when she listened to music, she goes, yeah. <laughs> 
But yeah, that's my claim to fame. One of them, I think. Nice. All right, it says, uh, Dennis, was Yellow Man an influence on you guys? Um, I wouldn't say Yellow Man was an influence, but he was one of our peers because Yellow Man's infamous for releasing five albums in one week. <laughs> Now explain the uh, yellow man to me. I've yellow never man is a DJ. Oh, okay. Zungu, okay. If you ever hear the song Zungu Zung Zungu Zungu Zeng, that's Yellow Man. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll have to look into more of that more. I'm uh, like I said, I'm le- I'm learning. I learn from guests more than I they they learn from me because I'm asking the yeah. obvious bullshit questions and <laughs> teaching not, me about the UK and all that. You're, so not, you're, not, like, you're not asking bullshit questions. You're cool. I know. I'm just being silly. <laughs> but bit, besides uh, the touring, what else? Uh, what else are you doing these days? I mean, you uh, I mean, you just kind of kind of full time musician type thing. Or you got any? Yeah. Uh, no. No, I'd be bored of that, Joe. <laughs> Joe, yeah, I'd be bored of it, trust me. I think because I didn't have music as my main and I didn't make it my be-all and end-all, I've not suffered in terms of frustration. I do get frustrated, but I know what I like. And I, I, I'm one of those people, if I don't like it, I don't do it. So when I finished my university degree, I, I trained as a... Uh, uh, what we call an inter a powered access instructor, you know the mutes cherry pickers. Okay. So I train people on them health and nice. safety, nice. and I just love it because it's it's something away from the music. It's and people I don't even talk. I will make reference to it, and people I might be training somebody and they recognize me, but they've only been with me for they've been with me for about four or five hours, right? Four. Check this out. So not first thing in the morning. Five hours later, they will come to me and go, uh, was you in a band? <laughs> <laughs> and I know for a fact that somebody's told them. Now, so that, now, that actually leads me to a question I was going to ask. I totally forgot. Have you ever been somewhere like at a club or just at a bar or something and, you know, Pastor Dutch comes out and you're just standing like, <laughs> like I don't you know, yeah. anybody notice or, yeah. or you're like, that's me, that's me, that's me. How, how oh, was I your attitude? Do toward- I don't do things like that. <laughs> and I don't do things like, do you know who I am? Because <laughs> if you know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in Birmingham, you know who I am. <laughs> if you're in Birmingham and you say that, they'll just say no. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, yeah, I have no clue who you are, bro. A very I mean, a question from Lep, he says, uh, "Did you ever meet Shaba Ranks?" No, Shaba was after us. Okay. When Shaba came through in the nineties, we were in the wind. Okay, I remember Shaba. 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 <laughs> Best of All right, good deal. Well, th- we'd like to thank Mr. Dennis Seaton for joining us thank today, you. sir. It has been an honor. Uh, before we go, how do people get a hold of you? And you, you promote a lot of stuff too. So, anything well, else to look, you, you can get us on Twitter at uh, Musical U30. You can get us on Instagram. I'm always on Instagram. Just hit me up on Instagram. Well, how did you get me? Yeah, I hit me up on Twitter. So, yeah, just follow him on Twitter. He's, he's got the blue check. Easy peasy, man. Just hit him up. He'll, he'll, just, uh, I'm sure he'll chat with you listen, and uh, inter- he, you know, entertain he, anything he, you got going on. I bet you thought he's going to be awkward, any? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I've done, I've done, I've done quite a bit, quite a bit of these. I, I've, uh, I've learned to take no for an answer quite a bit. Or a lot yeah, of that's don't, right. A lot of people just don't even see it, and they, you know, because if they're whatever, a lot of people are just like, oh, maybe, and then they're like, okay, and then I never hear from them again. So it's appreciate it's you being prompt and being on time and. uh <laughs> and doing it. it's an honor, I'm and uh, definitely uh, tonight when you're going on round, pass the duchy, and we will be live tonight, 9:30 Eastern. Yeah. If you're watching the UK now, you'll probably be in bed 2:30 in the morning. But we're going to be yeah. trying the world's hottest chocolate bar. It's called Mother of All Chocolate oh, Bars. Yeah. So what, be chili, ready for that it, here on uh, later tonight. And if you haven't subscribed to the show, please subscribe to the show, man. We love should, you guys. I should be promoting the album, but anyway. Eh, yeah, get, go out there and when you find musical youth, they, they're still they're towards the band, musical youth. Definitely yeah. uh, check out their new new tape. A new tape. New tape. 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 Check out the tape. <laughs> check out their new album on YouTube when it came when it drops or whatever. And I'm sure it's gonna it's be already dropped. It's already dropped, Joe. Oh, it's already out there. Okay. Spotify and all that stuff. Okay, yeah. So definitely check out some of the new shit, man. If you like this interview, and uh, definitely because because as you see, he's a nice guy. He's real nice, and he deserves some love. And he's Good a, musicians never die. Yeah, you gotta go back backwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's a he's a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, nice guys here. Hell yeah, man. Right, Thanks, Joey. guys. Like and subscribe. We'll talk to you tonight. Later, bye. Take care.